<laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome our guest today, Professor Alan Leichman from the University of Michigan. Um, Dr. Leichman is a professor of medicine there and the associate director of the Transplant Center. Um, his his long-standing interests have included um, the allocation and use of, of organs, uh, policy issues related to that, and living organ donor outcomes. Um, since 1989, Dr. Leichman has been the uh, primary physician for the University of Michigan's kidney and pancreas transplant programs and served as the medical director um, from 1989 to 2005. Um, his work on the OPTN as chair of the OPTN Kidney and Pancreas Committee uh, struggled with allocation issues um, years ago. Um, in fact, I, I learned last night that one of their proposals resulted in death threats to Dr. Leichman, um, showing that, that these are not trivial matters. Um, today, today, Dr. Leichman is going to talk to I, I should say that Dr. Leichman is one of the uh, great health service researchers in the field of transplantation. Uh, his work over decades has, has given us tremendous uh, new and primary information about, uh, about, about transplantation and its outcomes. Uh, his topic today is challenges in living kidney donor outcomes research, as you see up on the board. Uh, please join me in welcoming Alan Leichman. So um, I want to very much thank um, Mark and Laney and Rich and Michelle for inviting me. Um, I've been a uh, visiting faculty member at a number of institutions twice, but this is the first institution that I've been invited to three times. So I uh, am especially honored. The, um, I was going to talk about another topic, and I changed it at the last minute um, because of a challenge of living uh, kidney donor outcomes research. Namely, uh, we discovered that we had a file that uh, had misassigned data. So that's another problem that I didn't add to the slides, but uh, let me give you a little bit of background here about the renal and lung living donor evaluation study. So um, RELIV, uh, the renal and lung living donor evaluation study, is a U01 consortium. And it is funded and managed uh, through NIAID, but it's also funded to a large extent by both HRSA and the NHLBI. There are three study sites, uh, the Mayo Clinic, the University of, Air of um, Alabama, and the University of Minnesota uh, studying lung living donors. And there are two centers, USC and WashU, uh, that are examining outcomes in, I'm sorry, I misspoke. Um, Mayo, UAB, and uh, Minnesota are renal, and lung is USC and WashU. And the data coordinating center for um, both of these sets of studies is through the University of Michigan and uh, the Arbor Research Collaborative for Health. So um, RELIV uh, has six studies. Um, two of them are lung, that would be RELIV-02 and RELIV-05, and I'm not going to talk about the lung studies today, apologies, Ed. And uh, four of them are kidney studies. Uh, RELIV-01 looked at all donors at these three centers between 1964, when the first one was done at the University of Minnesota, through December 31st, 2007. And chart reviews were performed at all the study sites to try to identify who the donors were and to um, uh, assess the data that was available uh, from the medical records, which for the most part, because they're living donors, reflect only their pre- and immediate post-operative periods. Uh, then there was uh, national database linkage for vital status, cause of death, and ESRD, and resolution of a considerable number of, of uh, discrepancies. Uh, RELIV-03, which I'm not going to talk about today, um, was a prospective study looking at informed consent and living kidney donors. But in the very, very short form, uh, what RELIV-03 showed was that uh, better informed patients later reported better uh, health outcomes and that better informed patients uh, obviously also um, reported uh, better informed consents. Um, Cross-section study RELIV-04 
um, involve contact with patients or with donors. And all donors for whom contact information was available uh, and who were alive um, as of 6-30-2005 were invited to participate. Uh, they were assayed for renal and cardiovascular morbidities. In addition, their height, weight, blood pressure, creatinine, and urine analysis was obtained. And they underwent surveys regarding quality of life. And finally, Relive 06 um, measured glomerular filtration rates in white donors from Mayo and the University of Minnesota who had previously had post-donation glomerular filtration rates measured and black donors from the University of Alabama. And uh, there's now uh, a new cohort of uh, white donors uh, from the University of Alabama who are going to be assayed because the um, black donors from the University of Alabama had GFRs that were surprisingly higher than those of the white donors and we're trying to figure out if that's a characteristic of being black or of having your test done at the University of Alabama. Mm -hmm. So um, the sources of relive data. Um, I already mentioned that there was case reviews of um, all of the records that we could find at the three transplant centers. There's cross-sectional study data, which means that we had data directly from patients and including uh, GFR data on minority of the patients. Um, there was prospective study data and informed consent. We looked at the OPTN and the SRTR database for data on waitlisting, transplantation, and death. Um, we looked at the CMS database for um, dialysis service or end-stage renal disease service of any kind and death. We um, matched the Social Security Death Master File for death dates but not for cause of death. We match the National Death Index for death dates, cause of death, and we review the death certificates and everyone who we identified as having died. Uh, and we did this uh, to search for evidence of kidney failure or of uh, kidney disease that might not have been uh, captured from the other sources. And there, we're in the process now that NHANES has recently been linked to SSDMF and is in the process of being linked to CMS data of um, using uh, or building comparison groups uh, from the NHANES data sets. So Relive, um, the kidney part of Relive um, has 8,951 donors, uh, 2,300 from the Mayo Clinic, 2,900 from Alabama, and 3,700 from the University of Minnesota. We collected more than 1,000 variables. Uh, that include demographics, medical, surgical, family, and social history. And there was information on the pre-donation experience, interoperative course, post-donation uh, complications, and midterm and long-term outcomes. And truly thousands, probably tens of thousands of data queries were resolved. Uh, so what are the difficulties with performing studies on this scale? Well, one is it's just a lot of work. Uh, we're in the seventh year of Relive to date. There are actually 17 manuscripts in various stages of submission. Um, we are in the midst of uh, our last no-cost extension, uh, which will end at the end of June of this year. And we have just received an R21 to extend the scope of the Relive investigation, so Relive will continue for at least two more years. Um, finding agreement among a large group of investigators and methodology, methodology and the interpretation of results is a challenge because we are they and they are we. Uh, and um, there's a responder bias. So our, so Relive 01 started with uh, you know, 8,951 subjects. Um, we were able to find um, 7,029 individuals, or almost 80% of the sample, who were still alive and for whom addresses could be uh, ascertained. Of those 7,000 people, uh, only 2,957, or 33% of the O1 sample, or 42% of the eligible O4, uh, participated. So, you know, we have the question of the people who didn't respond, are they representative of the people who did respond? Is there something about the individual who did respond? Did they have fewer or more problems? Did they have, you know, um, better or worse experiences? That is, is really very, very hard to resolve because there's no way to get a comparison group from the people who are silent. Um, so let's talk about the topic, which is problems. So one problem is that transplant center records are often incomplete or unavailable. Um, these individuals from the 60s, if their data was available on microfiche, that was great. Uh, sometimes it simply couldn't be found. Sometimes there were people who were noted to have donated 
uh, with no record of there ever having been a donor surgery. There are people who are noted to have donated to recipients, and there was no record of the recipient having ever received a kidney. I mean, every flaw or foible that you can imagine in a medical record um, reflects on research when you're trying to do research using this as the source. Um, people, I think, are, don't appreciate that when data are collected for clinical, not research purposes, that the definitions of events change. And they're not only different between centers, but they change within the same center over time. So what might have been called a urinary tract infection in 1970 may not be called a urinary tract infection in 1990. What might have been called, um, you know, a bleed uh, or another complication in one year may be different in another year. And when we looked, in general, there was for every um, intra and post-op event we looked at, if we looked across the three centers at any given time point, there was between a two and a tenfold incidence in the uh, frequency in which the clinical record reflected this particular complication. So what does this mean? These are the best transplant programs in the world. These are the best hospitals in the world. If you, if one of these hospitals had reported to you um, their incidence of events post-transplant, and you had read that in a journal, you would say, my gosh, well, it's whichever hospital it is. And, you know, if it was the University of Michigan, University of Chicago, it would be the same. You know, with all those thousands of patients and with all those years of experience, this must reflect the donor experience. It doesn't. Just cancel it. You know, uh, if they came out as three, you know, separate uh, or, or five separate uh, individual center reports, you would say, my God, there's no way to figure this out. So I would tell you there's no way to figure this out. Um, there also is incomplete and absent follow-ups of donors and collection of data. Most donors at, at most hospitals get seen once post-transplant, and unless they're involved in an in organized follow-up, that really ends their um, interaction with their transplant center. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the uh, SRTR data collection in a while. But for practical purposes, just about everyone in this uh, cohort had one visit with their center post-op, and that is the end of their follow-up. Um, the data is not audited from clinical records for quality and completeness, and um, uh, I, I kind of uh, alluded to that, but let me give you examples of the kinds of things that, the, the consequences of this. Um, 107 relive 04 subjects self-reported a different race than that reported by the centers in relive. 601 relive 04 subjects self-reported a different ethnicity than that was reported by the, by the centers. Trust me, this continues on for just about anything you can imagine. Um, in addition, we know that Relive is an unrepresented cohort. There's few African Americans, and they're almost all at one center. And obviously, we don't have uh, prospectively matched uh, con uh, uh, controls. Um, although, I think we'll do a reasonable job with uh, the enhanced NHANES in generating a believable control group. Um, so, let's talk about administrative databases. Um, there's the CMS ESRD database. Um, it includes all medical enrollees who are 65 years and older, all those on dialysis. Uh, data is absent completely prior to 1972. It's incomplete prior to 1995 when it was mandated that all dialysis patients be included in the CMS uh, database. Uh, claims data are only available for Medicare beneficiaries. Uh, uh, and for those of you who don't do claims research, you have to understand that the diagnosis in the claims is the same whether you have the condition or not. So if you have a heart cath, you had a heart cath for coronary artery disease. It doesn't matter whether the heart cath was negative or positive, that's your claim, okay? Um, Social Security Death Master File, I'm going to talk about in a minute, but it has most deaths of those with Social Security numbers. Uh, organ Procurement Transplant Network and the Scientific Registry of Transplant Recipients uh, have databases, and there's the National Death Index, which not a lot of people use for research because it's expensive, but it is the treasure trove. Um, so, SSDMF restrictions. Uh, death records provided by the states are no longer included in the Social Security Death Master File. So effective November 1st, 2011, if your if Social Security Death Master File learns of your death from the states which report it, then those deaths are not reported. Uh, the reason for that was that there was a sense in Congress that uh, records on dead people were too easily available to criminals and that um, 
you know, for reasons of homeland security and uh, identity theft, that it was important to protect um, individuals who died, uh, the, the data from, of individuals who died from being exploited. My belief is that it's a problem that virtually never occurred. Uh, it was a solution for an, uh, basically a non-problem, but it has really impacted the ability to do uh, health outcomes research. Um, however, records obtained from other sources, family members, funeral homes, hospitals, financial institutions are still including SSDMF. So what's been the consequence since uh, November 2011? 4.2 million uh, deaths were removed from the database, but the database has 89 million records, so it's still pretty robust. And there will be 1 million fewer deaths added annually, which is about a, a third of the deaths. So um, right now, they're both the AST and the ASTS and numerous other health professions are trying to negotiate with Congress to um, change uh, these restrictions. But at this point, this is the law. All right. OPT and SRT are living donor data collection. There's no data at all before 1987. Data collection began in 1987. It was voluntary prior to 1994, and some centers, but only a minority, um, notified the OPTN of their living donors. Uh, some uh, notified the OPTN of some of their living donors, and most didn't notify the OPTN of any. And um, in terms of demographics, um, in general, many of those notifications were just notification that we did the transplant, but it didn't really have names, birth dates, social security number, the kind of stuff you need to trace these individuals and other databases. In 1994, social security numbers became a required field in the living donor registration form. In 1999, uh, living donor follow-up forms at six months and one year were added. And in 2008, living donor follow-up forms at two years were added. However, the living donor follow-up form criteria really meant that you had to submit a form. It didn't have to have any data. So most of the data points um, are less than 40% complete. And much of the data that was submitted was just the repeated data, because again, most of these donors were seen only one time post-op. So you know they asked the last date of visit, and the last date of visit was one week post-op. And what was the creatinine? Most recently, it was the creatinine one week post-op, it's, it's et cetera, et cetera. So as a database, uh, this is, is, is um, uh, flawed. Uh, I wish it were better. I was one of the principal investigators in the SRTR for a decade, but it is what it is. Um, and um, so uh, you can go to the National Death Index, which I said is the treasure trove. The, it has the death dates and the cause of death from all the U.S. states, the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico. Death certificates are available. So you can get the death certificate of any individual who you have identified as having died and you can review that death certificate. And there's lots of data on the death certificate. It tells you whether people had cancer, it tells you whether people had kidney disease, even if it tells you whether people had kidney failure. And this data is not available uh, in multiple other, in other sources um, at uh, this level or with this reliability. But it can't be used for administrative purposes. You can only use it for research purposes. And the reason for that is the NDI has a separate contract with each state and with Puerto Rico and DC and those separate contracts um, stipulate this. And those contracts are binding. So it's a conundrum uh, for doing this kind of research because uh, deaths that were identified through the NDI alone can't be reported to the OPTN, but federal regulations require that every center report every death to the OPTN. And deaths that are known to the transplant center uh, therefore, um, would, to perform this and, and to, for the transplant center to uh, become aware of a death through this mechanism would put the transplant center at risk. So the DCC actually wanted, wanted, wanted up blinding the transplant centers to their own deaths. So if you went to those centers and said, tell me who donated and died, they can only give you the partial list that they're aware of, but they can't actually give you the whole list because we can't let them know. Wish it were different again. All right. Um, so I think you've probably gotten the idea that you can't go to one data source and build a good clinical database. So additional ascertainment is needed not just from one source, but from multiple sources uh, to fully identify events that are not captured in clinical records. And the donor identifying data in medical records is sadly often incomplete or incorrect, which I mentioned. Um, but there's also limitations on matching algorithms. 
And I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And all of these databases, the OPT and SRTR, the CMS, Social Security Death Master File, are subject to error and issue regular updates with additions and corrections. And it was because of one of those errors and the release uh, not till this week of the update with corrections that I had to change my topic to talk to you guys today. Uh, so what are common sources of imperfect matches? Well, there's names. Lots of people use their middle name uh, as their first name. Uh, an initial or a nickname can be used for a first name. Uh, last names often don't match because of marriage or divorce, and that's more common for women. And names are misspelled. And so if you're matching on names and you get a name from a hospital record, it just may not match in the other databases for these kinds of reasons. Uh, digits are transposed. So you can have one or two digits that are wrong. Uh, threes are often mistaken for eights and vice versa. Leading O's are missing because they can be dropped during data collection processes. Mm -hmm. And in older data, women ha will have their husband's social security number and children will have their parents' social security number. So if you were a child uh, in the 1970s and your father donated to you, the donor and the child both had the same social security number. If either one of them died, there's no way to tell which one was dead unless you can get a death record that shows a date of birth. That's accurate, which goes to date of birth. Uh, date of birth is wrong or not known frequently. Uh, the month of birth is wrong. You know, August might have been transcribed as the ninth month instead of the eighth month. Uh, the year of birth, especially for people who um, are older, um, where the records may not have been accurate or may not exist of their actual births uh, can be off by one or two years. Uh, and days and months are transposed, 04 and 104. So we have these incredibly sophisticated um, matching algorithms that we use to try and match databases. Uh, we being the Kidney Epidemiology and Cost Center and Arbor Research Collaborative for Health, because this is what we do. And we apply fl fuzzy logic. And the matching algorithm first looks for exact matches, and then it looks for alternative spellings, and it looks for name order, and it looks for transposed digits in Social Security, and it looks for transposed digits in years, and it looks for, uh, you know, closest match. And using these algorithms, which use fuzzy logic, then you get a probability of a match, okay? So I'll show you how hard it is with this. So you need to be a little skeptical when you read manuscripts where someone says, oh, we looked at all our patients we matched with Social, to the Social Security Death Master file, and here's the number of events we found. Okay, you can, th those, manuscripts, it's, those manuscripts shouldn't be published anymore, literally, but they, they still are. But you need to be very skeptical about beliefs and, and information that are based on those kinds of studies. So there were 650 deaths obtained from the Social Security Death Master file through at least one of the two matching algorithms that we used. And the first matching algorithm we used is one that is used primarily for finding events among uh, transplant recipients. And the second algorithm is primarily for finding events among people with cancer. Uh, the, um, so between these two complicated algorithms, 554 uh, individuals were identified in both databases. So that's 85% of the deaths. 87 deaths were identified with algorithm A, but not with algorithm B. That's 13% of deaths. And nine deaths were identified with algorithm B, but not with algorithm A. So algorithm A, you know, in this case, is, is a bit more robust than algorithm B. Now, there were 734 total deaths that were identified, though. So that 650 that were used through the matching you know, represents only about 80% of the deaths. So the 734 deaths that were identified, 432 reported by the center. So the centers were aware of 60% of the deaths. Uh, 650 were found in the Social Security Death Master File, so that's 89% of the deaths. 686 were found in the NDI, which is 93% of the deaths. 77 were found in the NDI, but not <clears throat> in the Social Security Death Master File, and, and this was done before the November 11th restriction. So this was when the Social Security uh, <coughs> Death Master File was its most robust. Um, and it's only by aggregating all of these individuals that we came to understand that there were 734 total deaths in the donor population and not the 434 that were reported by the centers, or that if a single center was trying to do research, even though this research was done very, very carefully, 
would, that they would have had available to match to other public databases. Um, then, Lane, this is actually pertinent to our conversation last night. I, for, I forgot about the slide. So there were 63 donors with ESRD. So 39 were reported by the centers. That's 62% of cases. 12 were found in the OPTN SRD, SRT, our candidate recipient database, which is 19%. 13 were identified from NDI um, it, it with uh, were um, chronic maintenance dialysis patients who were identified as having chronic kidney disease. And that was 21% of cases, and 52 were found in CMS ESRD, our ESRD database. So the question you asked me last night of what percentage of the OPTN SRTR you know, of, of renal failure uh, <coughs> might be captured, at least from these three centers, it's 19%. So I think the bad news is that these three centers are probably pretty good respondents. It's probably worse overall than that if you went to all centers. All right. So then we're tr we've been struggling with the control group. And Relive is in the process of linking with, the, uh, with NHANES to establish control rates of events in a matched population. So there's six NHANES cohorts. The earliest dates back to 1971. The data elements that are collected in each of the cohorts are slightly different. And the data definitions, that is what's an event, are different for each of the cohorts. Um, but, you know, it's, it's no worse than what the transplant centers are doing. So, you know, in that respect, you know, there's sort of a, a, a comparability. Um, and the other thing is that um, NHANES has been linked now to SSDMF. Now it's the new regulation SSDMF, so there's going to be missing deaths, more missing deaths, uh, and to the CMS database, which I think is going to be completed this month. And we are going then to try to match the Relive cohort to this augmented and Haynes cohort. And um, uh, we start, the process we start by is we're going to screen the Haynes cohort for conditions that would preclude donation. So people with cancer, people who are very, very old, people with infections, people with you know, severe heart disease, we're going to exclude those from the Haynes population. Then among those people who are healthy in the Haynes population, we're going to match to donors based on sex, race, and ethnicity, and history of tobacco use. And then we're going to use progressive radius matching for age with um, moving out to up to plus or minus five years, uh, BMI plus or minus two, and systolic blood pressure up to plus or minus 15. And using this strategy, you know, we, we haven't gone down to match, but playing with their data, we think we'll be able to match about 95% of our um, relive uh, population. Uh, one of the things is that the match has to perform physically at CDC. So you can't, they don't send you a database. You can make an electronic collection, connection with them and shadow what they're doing, or you can send something physically down to sit with them to negotiate with, what they're doing. But you can't get the data, and then you get a de-identified file back. So, um, which, is, which, is very, which is appropriate to protecting the NHANES individuals, and actually it doesn't really harm the research if you have the resources to do that, which blessedly we do. So, conclusions. Death and ESRD information are available from national databases, but the quality of the results depend on the use of multiple data sources, the accuracy of the matching algorithm, and the care used to resolve imperfect matches. Midterm and long-term morbidity, quality of life, psychosocial and socioeconomic data are not consistently available from transplant centers, and they're not available at all from public sources. The absence of prospective match controls can be partially overcome uh, through matching like we're proposing within Haines, but they contribute to uncertainty in evaluating donor outcomes. The value of the relive studies is they're comprehensive with medical, surgical, psychosocial, and socioeconomic endpoints. Um, the cross-sectional components capture midterm morbidities, which really you can't get other than you ha by having contact with the patients. You have to somehow have a c get this information from the patient either through their doctor as a surrogate or from them directly. The size, scope, and duration of RELIVE allows a high probability of accurately estimating frequency of common post-donation events, of identifying uncommon or late events, and of describing the evolution of donor outcomes over time. The quality of life studies offer donors the chance to comment in their own words, and many of those comments are poignant. And one of the publications we are preparing is sort of a donor in their own word comment. And uh, 
you know, it, it's, 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 it's touching. These, these were people, so many of these people did this in the most loving way and um, their lives were, were changed and, and they expressed that to us beautifully. Uh, and uh, we prospectively studied informed consent. So let's see where we are with time. You want to look at some real-life data? I got some real-life data. Okay. This is just demographic data. Um, so uh, there were 8,951 uh, individuals in the study. Um, early on, the University of Minnesota was the largest center. Hold on. There we go. Um, and represented about 58% of the sample for the first decade. Um, by the fourth decade of uh, follow-up, uh, the three centers, Mayo, uh, UAB, and UMNM, were about the same size, but about 40% of all the study data came from, comes from Minnesota. Um, Females uh, are more likely to donate. Uh, they became progressively more likely to donate in each of the decades of the studies. So in the first decade, it was 51%. By the fourth decade, it was 58%. Um, most donors are white. Um, and the number, uh, the percentage, rather, of African-American donors hasn't changed much in the last uh, 30 years. Uh, the donors are getting older. Uh, the <coughs> median age has increased from by about four years from a uh, 37.1 years, plus or minus 11.9 years, to 40.5 years uh, in the most recent decade. Um, it's not that the percentage of older donors has increased much over the last 30 years. It was 3% between 75 and 85, and 4% between 86 and 96, and 3% uh, again um, between 97 and 2007. But what you find is there are fewer younger donors. So if you look at donors under the age of 30, they've had by an percentage basis from 36 percent 40 years ago to 18 percent in the most recent decade that we studied. How many were um, I, I don't know that off the top, um, but you know, we, we looked at people under 17 and it, it's a handful. But they're less likely to be donors now, but, it, but it's a handful. I mean, it's, it's, it's not many. And um, um, I'm going to show you, uh, this is called a Lois a diagram. And um, it, whoops, sorry about that. Oh, well, there you go. And in lowest diagrams, every point represents an individual. So there's, if you could tell, there's 8,951 points on this. And the middle line, the green line, I'm going to show you a bunch of these, is the, the median, 50% above, 50% below. The yellow lines describe the 25th, the 75th percentile. This is, the blue lines are roughly the fifth to the 95th. Um, they're not precise because they actually come from a, a mathematical formula, but that's the gist of it. And these are the regression lines for the highest and the lowest value. So since they're a regression line, you can have some points above the regression line and some below, but this is the regression line. So if you look at age, you know, you can see that, you know, the median is up a bit, but the 25th percentile is up quite a bit reflecting the fact that there are fewer younger donors. Um, you know, there's sort of a, as Laney just suggested, there's sort of a bottom barrier, so you can't have much change in the minimum. Uh, you just don't have many donors under the age of 17 or 18. But although the number of people over the age of 60, as I just showed you, and in the, per, in the percent over the age of 60 hasn't changed much, you can see that our tolerance of people who are far over 60 has increased. So it's not that the number of older donors is going up on a percentage basis, but, they are, but the range of acceptable ages among older donors has increased. All right, so uh, no surprise that um, fewer of us smoke uh, in the more recent decades than in the 60s, and more of us have never smoked in the more recent decades than in the 60s. Um, there were a number of publications around 1988 uh, demonstrating good results among biologically unrelated living donors. And so, as you can see, there were virtually none in the first 20 years of the study. In the 80s and early 90s, when people started to appreciate that you could have a good result with a living unrelated donor, uh, this practice began to emerge. And between 97 and 2007, at these three centers, it represented about a third of all donors. And I suspect if you assay now, because in the most recent years, it's been more than 40% of donors that are living unrelated, that at these centers, you'd see similar. All right. And just because we're a little late on time, this is sort of the same data again. All right. Body mass index. 
donors are getting heavier. So the mean BMI was 24.3 in the first decade of the study, and it rose to 27.3 by the fourth decade of the study. And that's a big change. Where did it change? Well, the very obese, on a percentage basis, really didn't change at all. They, you know, in the last 20 years, they're 4%, 5%. Uh, and the more massively obese, those with BMIs over 40, you know, they're 1% or less of, this, of the sample uh, going forward, you know, really across all time. Uh, the change has been that people who are normal weight, people with B, by the World Health Organization, people with BMIs less than 25, um, have reduced from 50% to 34%. And so the increases obviously are among the slightly overweight and the mildly obese. And again, here's the, the lowest uh, diagram. And, you know, it shows that, you know, the, you know, there's a small increase in the mean, uh, there's a small increase in the 20th percentile. And the thing that's changed has not been that there's a lot more donors on a percentage basis who are, um, hot, who are heavy. It's that we've allowed donors with BMIs, you know, 45 or higher in recent years, and it's just a few people, but it's just different than it was before. And again, when you look at the lowest diagram, you have to realize that th this is based on the maximum value, so one individual has a large effect on the curve, on the regression. All right, fasting blood sugars, um, they are a bit higher. They were, the mean was 86 in the first decade, and it's 93.5 in the most recent decade. Um, if you look at people who would have been diagnosed as diabetic, uh, either under earlier criteria or more current criteria, it hasn't changed much, 2%, 1%, it's about the same. Um, if you look at individuals who are borderline, it hasn't changed much, uh, 1 or 2%. Um, but if you look at people who had um, <coughs> fasting blood sugars that are less than 100, our criteria are more strict. In fact, our FBS is, is a fraction have increased. So I think if you talk to people in the community, they say, oh yeah, we're taking all these diabetics and many more diabetics than ever didn't. In fact, at least at these three centers, it's not the case, nor is it the case that we've l relaxed criteria about the percentage of people who we require to have be truly normal. To, to the contrary, it's been the other way around. And all this stuff about we're taking diabetic donors is urban myth. Uh, but again, as I showed you before, if you look, the tolerance uh, among those who um, are abnormal, uh, we are grabbing more people who are more abnormal than we did before, even if the percentage of those people hasn't changed much. Uh, cholesterol. So we have better control of cholesterol than we did a while ago, so it's a little better. Triglycerides are getting fatter. They're a little bit worse. Uh, let me just skip through these so we don't get caught up. High blood pressure. So. Uh, again, the urban myth is that we have much higher percentage of, hy of hypertensive donors now than we used to. Um, so it's 7 or 8 percent through the whole 40-year cohort. Um, if you look at systolic blood pressures, those with systolic blood pressures over 140, you know, the percentage basis really hasn't changed. Look at diastolic blood pressures, those diastolic blood pressures over 90 really hasn't changed. Going to the lowest diagrams, again, you know, uh, there's just really no trends here that are meaningful except for the tolerance of more people who have blood pressures that are more high. But again, you know, these points here represent dozens and dozens of people. These are single individuals. I mean, the, you know, again, it's, it's, it's not much different. And again, there's this urban myth that we're transplanting, you know, hundreds and hundreds of hypertensive patients, which isn't the case. The same is true with diastolic. You know, we have a, have a tolerance for some people with higher single diastolics than once we did. Uh, but again, there's really no difference in the population. Um, and then if you look at the blood pressure among hypertensive donors, people with hypertension, uh, you can see that they um, are perhaps a little less well treated in the modern era uh, than in previous eras, and I find that as a surprise, but you know, presumably if this transplant center decided to transplant them, they also decided to transplant them with a trend to improve uh, their uh, hypertensiveness. All right, creatinines, um, you know, the methodology changed in here for measuring creatinine, so they ought to be down a bit, and they're down a bit. And I don't know if I have much to say about that. 
these are a little bit peculiar, and I would assume that there must have been some other data that the transplant center had when they accepted the patient, and that we just happened to have the data from their database, but that maybe there was a repeat on the outside or something like that. I find it hard to believe that people with creatinines, approximately two, would be allowed to donate. And so, some people had more than one condition. So among those under 60, 62% were had neither obesity or hypertension or glucose tolerance. Uh, there were 13% who had obesity alone. There were 14% who had glucose intolerance alone, and there was a 5% overlap. Uh, there were 3% that had hypertension alone, and they had a 1% overlap with the obese, and they had a 1% uh, overlap with the glucose intolerant, and then there was a magical 1% which had all three criteria. If you look at those over 60, you would have 6% uh, that were obese, 11% uh, that were hypertensive. Again, the overlap uh, between the obese and the hypertensive is 2%. Uh, that would be my own personal diabetic, I mean, uh, demographic group. Uh, the glucose intolerance, 23% of the older, uh, with 10% overlap with hypertension, with 17% overlap with obesity, and 4% had all three, and only 40% had none. All right, so thank you, and uh, I hope that this is not too discouraging. Thank you very much. Um, we both go by our middle names, and from the database confusion, I'm not sure if that means that we are already dead or never will die. <laughs> <laughs> um, despite the limitations of the database, it's some very interesting data. Um, questions from the, from the group? Michelle? What do you think that the upcoming changes in the um, regulations with, with the uh, need for centers to report up to two years on living donors is going to do for us uh, with respect to missing data and, and also with respect to knowing what's going to happen to donors in, in the uh, short run? Um, all right. Well, that's, that's actually a complicated question. So I think the data will get better. And I think one of the reasons the data will get better is because you, it won't be acceptable just to turn in the form part, mark that I turned in the form. So there will have to be some contact with donors. Donors are hard to keep track of. You know, they're healthy people who, you know, often live very far away and have no particular motivation to be studied. And so they proved an elusive population. Um, we, we had, as I know, you know, because you were there, um, a national consensus conference on how to follow donors. And the national consensus conference um, <coughs> recommended that transplant centers not follow donors. Uh, but instead that donors be followed by professional organizations that follow people. And the model for that is bone marrow donors who are followed by an independent organization and not by the, um, either the donors or the recipient center. And they have remarkable follow-up. I mean, it's, 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 you know, they can find more than 90% of the people who have ever donated a, a bone marrow. And they contact them regularly and they update their, you know, contact information. And, you know, so I think it's a model for success. I, I personally think that the new regulations are a model for failure. And, you know, it'll be better than what we have and it's not good enough. Now, form fortunately, there's actually a, a member of Congress who is at least discussing um, uh, a bill that would mandate the recommendations of the consensus conference, and that would be perhaps good if Congress passes anything. Uh, but it would be, you know, it could be seen as a, as a cost savings because having one group of people who do nothing but follow people is better than having 258 groups of people who don't know how to follow people chase them down. It's got to be cheaper. So maybe they can pass it off as a cost saving. Um, oh, I'm sorry. Then, then the other thing is donors are screened. So nothing bad for practical purposes happens to donors in the first two years that the transplant center probably doesn't know about. So is it worth focusing all the energy on basically early outcomes? And I think that's not true. I think that the focus should be on midterm outcomes. You know, do they develop cardiovascular disease as a consequence of having only one kidney? Do you know, are they at risk for, you know, ESRD and all the consequences of ESRD? And that, 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 that sorry. 
that this this new impetus obviously is an arrow aimed in exactly a different direction. So, Larry, yes. Speaking of microphone. That was great. Uh, just a s small question on your data of race donors. Mm -hmm. The um, aggregate uh, data showed the ten percent African Americans. What was the UAB percentage since they had mostly African American recipients? I suppose. Yeah, um, I don't want to make up a number, but it was somewhere near 20 percent. I can't remember the exact number. Not significantly. Pardon? Not so significantly different. Well, I mean, still small. So just. But but you know, 20 fold higher than the other centers. Alan, what do you think will be the impact of these type of data in terms of um, uh, what you will utilize as information to get informed consent? Uh, which is at least part of the reason for finding out uh, all these data. What what can you do with them? Yeah. And how is so, this going to change living donation? So I, I, my belief is not just this data, but other data that I you know haven't reported today, is that we're going to find out that what we thought we knew was pretty much what we know, and but it will you know give us a more authoritative source. And in the community, there are, you know, a cadre of prior donors who very much wish that they'd had more reliable and more robust information. And certainly government regulators are pushing the community to develop um, more robust uh, data. And in fact, the, the origins of Relive really come from ACOT. There's something called the Advisory Committee on Transplantation, which asked the Secretary of Health and Human Services to do a study that could be definitive. And uh, the Secretary of Health and Service, Human Services then required of uh, the NIH that they fund such a study. And you know, this study is, is that study. Um, so I, I, you know, whether prospective donors um, feel that the they need better information than the information that centers tell them. You know, something that, you know, I don't know. Um, but uh, there is, um, will be data about what kinds of information people thought they needed more of, and certainly the community could respond to that, you know, if, if they so chose. Uh, so the question is, how did, he, how did the donors get segregated uh, in a variety of different uh, fashions? Yeah. So the the question was about deceased donors, and you know, the, that's all right. And and all, all of this data refers to living donors who actually donated. Well, who, except for a few who we don't know that they actually donated. Any other question? Any other questions? So I I didn't actually present this with the idea of discouraging people from doing this research. I think people need to appreciate that it's hard to do this research well. What I really want people to do is have skepticism about this flood of sort of poorly done, you know, quote unquote, outcomes research that really is not interpretable. And as I said, I'm surprised these things still get published. But, you know, when you look at the literature, so much of it is sort of, you know, the methodology is, is, is casual. And I, I just think that it's a benefit to all of us to realize that you just can't go look in your clinical database from your hospital's billing records and go throw it up against the Social Security death master file and then make a publication that purports to tell what any kind of outcome is. And that's true for any disease. And so I, I would just urge people, again, to be aware as they read um, these manuscripts what kinds of things to look for in the methodology that might give you confidence or reduce your confidence in you know, that particular um, uh, publication. What do you think the role of primary care physicians is in following um, donors, if at all? Um, well, you know, most donors don't live near the center where they donated, don't have a relationship on the donation with that center. It would be a burden for them to drive to that center for follow-up. So I think that follow-up of donors, you know, is most properly done within the community in which they live. Um, people tell donors different things. You know, I, I tell our donors, I mean, some people tell their donors, and, and actually now there's a regulation that we have to tell donors that they should get uh, a follow-up every year, which, which is, and so to comply with that, we now tell people that. 
But, you know, what I t tell donors is th I, that I will give you the same advice whether you have one kidney or two or whether you donate or not, which is I don't know what the future is going to hold. And down the road, you may develop diabetes or high blood pressure or some other condition that might affect your kidneys. And that the quality of the care that you're provided is going to be variable depending on who you happens to be your physician. And it's important that you take responsibility and common sense to make sure that you get good care. So, you know, you know what normal blood pressure is. If you're seeing a doctor and he's giving you blood pressure medications, your blood pressure is not normal, you need to take responsibility to demand better blood pressure control. Or, you know, if you become diabetic, you need to take, you know, uh, responsibility to demand, you know, optimal diabetes control. And I said in any other condition that you may develop in your health down the road, you know, it's, it's important that you do that. Can I push you on that point, Alan? It's somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of living donors don't actually have health insurance at the time they donate. So how do you expect them to get that health care? So, the, so, the, so the, the first thing is, you know, we only say those words that you should get yearly follow-up because the government mandates us to. Uh, you know, I don't expect any of them, unless they already have high blood pressure or diabetes when they walk in the door, to develop it soon. And if you have insurance now, or you may not have insurance when you develop this condition, and if you don't have insurance now, you may or may not have insurance when you develop that condition. And, you know, I'm a big uh, fan of the Affordable Care Act for that reason. That was, that was what Mark's comment was to the ACA. Um, so, uh, Alan, thank you very much. We're at the, the 1 o'clock hour, so um, uh, thank everyone for showing up. Mark, um, well, so.